All right, guys, welcome back to the F350 build. Now, when we last left off, I had the engine all put together, but I didn't have a transmission. So let's head over to the transmission shop and check out that teardown in progress. All right, guys, here's the C6 on the table here at the transmission shop. I wanted to give it a little once over before we actually get this thing taken apart and see what the insides look like. Look at the color of that fluid. So far, so good. That's not bad. Not bad. Not bad at all. The oil pump's looking good. Check out this brass in there. Not bad. That's your high in reverse. That's not bad. Nice. A little dry from sitting, but... So far, so good. You said low reverse? Yep. There's two reverses? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it, it takes two things to make one thing work. Nice. A lot of parts. Guys, I'd like to show you one of the dumbest designs that Ford has ever incorporated into one of their vehicles. This headlight switch is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen. It's pretty obvious to me that Ford outsourced the design of this to Germany, or they brought in some German guy who thought it would be a wonderful idea to make this unbelievably complicated and failure prone. Now on the windshield wiper switch, it's super simple. Where's the knob? It's uh, right here. You just turn it and then you've got this tiny little set screw and the screw just pulls the knob right off, right? Simple. Why don't you do the same thing to the headlight switch? Nope, we want to make it unbelievably complicated. Now, this is the shaft for the headlight. When I was removing it, it broke like every single one of these I've ever removed has. Every one of them, 100% of them have broken. In this case, uh, there's these little ridges here, and those ridges bite in. Whoop, those ridges bite into the plastic on the inside of this. I don't know if they use any glue or not in there, but sometimes that's what breaks. Usually, the guys get frustrated enough that they end up breaking this uh, because. Jeez, that's loud. Because these are usually in pretty bad shape anyways, but in this case, this was in great shape, so I had to make sure that I didn't damage it. Now, on the back side of the shaft here, you see this little ring right here? There is a button on the top right here that you need to push down in order to separate a tiny little, you know, spring clip on each side that then allows us to pull out. The problem is over time, that spring in there wears out and it'll still get caught on this little lip and makes it practically impossible to remove. Also, you have to get your hands all the way up in there and around and then push down on it. And it's super uncomfortable because it's too small. So you're, you're jabbing it into your fingers. So usually what I do is I take a washer uh, and I put it, bring it back in there on my finger so that I can get a little extra force on it. I almost got this one. I thought it was gonna be the first one ever, but no, when I was wiggling it and pulling it, finally the knob came off. But luckily I can just use a little bit of a two-part epoxy to seal this together and then push it back in there. But I wanted to show you guys because this is, I think this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen on any Ford. And it's like this for many years. I know 73 to 79, maybe more years, but it's excruciatingly stupid. I'll let you guys know if I think of anything else that's that Ford has ever done that's quite as dumb. I'd, I'd make a list of, of German cars that have stupid things like that, but that list would be as thick as the Bible. Ridiculous. All right, back to work. Guys, I wanna show you the firewall. I've got it all sprayed down with a degreaser, but I haven't cleaned it up yet. I think it'll come out pretty good. You could see as even as I was spraying it, you could see all the dirt and goodies starting to wipe off. So I give it one more coat of the degreaser, hit it with the old pressure washer, and then I'll show it to you. Guys, big difference. I couldn't believe how much crud was on there. I'm a little sad that we lost the wax marks from the factory, but it's much cleaner. Ah, the life of a shop dog. Whoa, you're up. What's up, BC? Is it lunch 30? All right, guys, I've got a power booster, master cylinder, and proportioning valve installed. Now, these are universal. They're designed to work with pretty much any vehicle. This is the largest power booster that uh, Summit sells. This is the 8-inch one. They also make a 7 and a 6-inch. I went with the 8-inch because this is a pickup truck with 37-inch tires. Now, let me go ahead and pull this off so that I can show you what I had to do as far as adapters go to make a universal braking system work. 
All right guys, so the power booster is sold separately from the adapter kit. The adapter kit comes with a lengthening rod and then it comes with different types of adapters so that you can mount it to different steering types. Now most brake pedals have a shaft that comes out where you'll use one of these to slide over the shaft and then you slide a cotter pin into the, the factory brake shaft. In this case, the brake pedal had a hole through it, so you use this style with a little adapter that goes through there and then you cotter pin it on the inside. Now to get this measurement, what I did was I set it up on the vehicle with this adapter off and then I measured the distance between the brake pedal when it was fully out and then I did have to cut this rod to a good length where I left just enough threading there so that I can adjust it later on and then tighten the two lock nuts and we're good to go. So let me get this installed back on here and uh, move on to the next thing. Alright guys, I've got my cardboard mocked up to replace the factory uh, panel there that went for the AC system. I've got my steel piece already cut out right here and then I've already got the holes drilled so it mates up just fine. Next I put the Gen 4 vintage air kit up against it with the bracket that it comes with. This is just a universal bracket so it takes a little finagling to make it work but I've got these holes marked out. Next step is going to be uh, drill a couple more holes for this and then I'll be able to, well I'll have to bead roll this before I install it just to make it look a little nicer and then I'm probably on the top bracket here. I'm probably gonna have to mark a line here and then I'll use my bender and bend this 90 degrees so it can mount to where the glove box goes. But I'll show you that after I get these holes drilled and this mounted up. All right guys, I wanna show you the only modification that I had to make to the universal brackets that come with the Gen 4 kit. This front bracket here, I did have to mark it and then I put this through my bender here to put a nice 90 degree bend and then I added just this little plate. I did put a bead roll in it to make it a little bit stronger, but all that does is hold the front end up and then keep it from wiggling around. So I just wanted to show you guys that. I'll give you a better look once it's out of here. So here it is out of the truck. You can see just this one bend that I had to put on it nice and simple now one thing that's cool about this you can see the bulkhead fittings here that go through uh, it, what's nice is that this entire assembly can be installed back through the vehicle from the outside so you just kind of fit it all in and that means that I can hook up these kind of tight fitting between like uh, here's our heater core and then our evaporator for the AC system and you can see these are real tight little bends that I have to meet up with and what's nice is I can have these all done as one unit and then slide it into the vehicle rather than having to monkey around under the dash. So the next step is going to be to pull this off. I'm going to apply an etching primer on both sides. Uh, the outside here that you're going to see under the hood, I decided I'm going to paint that the factory uh, yellow color and then on the inside I'll just shoot it with a quick black just to give it some rust protection. So I'll do that now and then I'll be able to uh, finish up this AC system. All right, guys, I'm working on the custom hoses for the air conditioning system. You can see this one has already been crimped and is made up. This one has not been, so I wanted to show you kind of the process. Basically here we've got a 10 AN fitting on each side, so I went ahead and installed those. I did a straight one on top here, and then I did a 45 degree one right here. Now the hose has a natural kind of a bend to it. You see it's, you know, obviously stored rolled. So I went with the natural curve to kind of help it flow through there. And then I make a little H mark. So you see a line here and a line here and then a line on the hose. So you can see how far the hose goes in or out. And then I made another one right here. And that's because when I remove these, it's easy to get them twisted. And you've got a little bit of play, but you don't want to overdo it because it's a tight fit, especially how I've got it configured here. So let me go ahead and uh, remove this and then I'll throw it on my crimping tool and then we'll get these crimped. Double check that the marks are good. And I put it in closer to the outside here because you don't know exactly how far it is. And I put the edge of the tool, not the tooth, but the edge of the tool right up against this little metal lip. So it's sticking out just that lip, lip width. Gonna prick that. Check that. Now this does a really good job on the small ones. But if you notice, you see here how it kind of pinches out the sides here. On these bigger hoses, specifically the 10s, I've never done a 12, but I would imagine it'd be the same. I'll go ahead and rotate it to a different position and go again into the same teeth. It looks like the ones you get from the auto parts store. 
All right, guys, I need to make an adapter for the back of this. Vintage Air doesn't have one that's the right size. If you go to their page and then to the products, uh, they've got a bunch of different ones, but just nothing that fits this close enough. So I'm gonna make my own and I'm gonna do it out of steel. It's pretty straightforward. I just have to cut this and then I need to cut this piece of muffler tubing down the middle and then I'm gonna weld them, bink, bink, and then uh, drill out some holes and then it'll be good to go. So uh, first things first, I marked up the steel here just to kind of get a rough cutout. I'm going to do a little bit straighter lines all the way around and then I'll chop it up and uh, we'll go from there. All right guys, I've got all the straight lines marked out so I can just cut it bing, bang, then these little guys ding, 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 and then we'll start folding it. All right, here's the box all bent up. It fits pretty close. I've already got the two little holes marked up and then I'm going to slice this in half. Weld uh, one and a half there, one half there. Well. First, I should probably make sure that I can get the uh, sleeves around it before I put them that close. First, I'll do that, and then I'll put it together. All right, guys, now the duct that goes to the driver's side, it has a rigid duct that goes all the way to right here. Now, that rigid duct then goes to this flexible duct, which would then go to the factory unit. Now, what I did, I cut it right here, and as you can see, this uh, adapter from Vintage Air fit perfectly through there. So I kind of had to force it through and then the lip of the adapter fits right in between these little ridges. So snug as a bug in a rug. So I'll just use a little bit of sealing tape right here on that and then we'll be able to slide this on and then we'll be able to adapt this to the Vintage Air kit. All right guys, here is the rigid airflow ductwork for the defrost. You can see our two defrost setups here. And then this is what comes in the universal kit. Now, what's nice about this is that you can install them this way or you can install them this way. In this case, I think I'm going to end up running the aftermarket ones because they end up fitting just about perfect in there. So all I'll have to do is uh, drill a couple holes, just one on each end here, right here, and then right here. And then the holes aren't gonna line up perfectly with these. They're gonna be just a little bit to the outside, but that's all right. And then I'm gonna just run the flexible ductwork. Now what I could have done was I could have made another one of those adapters, this, the, in this case, a rectangular adapter with two uh, two inch muffler fittings, but that would have just end up being more work. And this is a little bit more cumbersome. And I'm not sure if we're gonna need any of that space for the ductwork that ends up running along the backside behind the glove box to this side over here. So that's why I'm gonna run these factory ones. That's usually the case. Uh, the, the aftermarket ones are pretty good. As long as you can fit them in there, they seem to work a little bit better. All right, guys, I'm getting ready to marry the engine to the transmission here. Now, when the old Dodge here was getting the transmission built, I was talking to Fred and Aaron over at FSR Diesel, and they said that I did not have to fill the torque converter with fluid, that it'll be all right without it. But that made me nervous, so they said I could go ahead and put a quart or two if I wanted. And so I talked to Dale, who built this transmission over at Denny's, and he said same thing. He goes, you don't absolutely have to, but it's not a bad idea, especially because uh, this specific C6 with the four-wheel drive and the deep pan configuration holds 15 quarts, and the torque converter when full holds about eight. So he said, go ahead and throw three quarts in. That way it doesn't leak out when you're installing it, but at least there's a, something to start with in there. But apparently that's not necessary. That was a surprise to me. Now, if you notice here, there are two little keys right here that fit into the oil pump. So I'm going to try to align those best I can. Looks like it's right here and right here. So I'll go ahead and slide that in. One thing he did uh, tell me to make a note of was some of the flywheels only have two spots here for the drain hole. I guess you've got four bolts for the torque converter. And then you see next to the torque converter bolts on all four points, you've got a little drain filler. And uh, well, I can't show you because now the torque converter is full of fluid, but he said, make sure that uh, if you've got the kind that has two, that you don't accidentally clock it in a position that you can't drain it. So there you have it. All right, let's put this together. All right, guys, I've got the torque converter installed. When I first put it in, I couldn't quite tell if it was in all the way. Basically, you've got two sets of gears or two sets of splines, rather, and then you've got the oil pump and it has to mate to all three of those, bing, bang, boom. And so what I did was I measured the distance here between where the transmission mounts up against the block here to where the torque converter mounts to the flex plate, which of course is right there. I took that measurement and then I used this here to hold it up against so that I could get the measurement between here and here. And sure enough, I was about a mm, quarter of an inch 
uh, not far enough. Now the torque converter does pull in to the flex plate once you're actually tightening it down. So I needed it to go in about a half an inch more. That way it was a quarter inch farther than the flex plate instead of being a quarter inch too tight. So sure enough, I spun it around and then locked it in. So I was not in on the oil pump. If I would have tried to install it that way, what would have happened is I would have ended up, while tightening down the bolts into the transmission, it would have put stress on the uh, seal and on the oil pump. And then I would have realized my mistake, loosened it, pulled the transmission back out, realigned it, gotten everything working, put it all back together, and then the oil pump would have failed. Don't ask me how I know. But hey, never make that mistake again. And luckily it was my own vehicle when I was like 16. Guys, my measurements were off by a little bit. Finger width there, and the heavy duty oil cooler is not clearing the cross member. The steering is gonna be close, but it'll fit, but I will sadly have to remove the oil cooler. That's okay, I can put one on the front if I have to. Ah, what a bummer though, so close. All right, guys, I'm moving forward and I've got a few things I want to show you. This here, that fuel selector switch, the two holes that are in the frame, they line up exactly. So Ford never changed it for a million years. The problem is it's gonna run some interference issues at the top here where those fittings are. I'm seeing if I can track down a couple of uh, Ford connector fittings. These are just the factory Ford fuel line style ones. I know Dorman makes some, uh, basically there's two sizes. Let me pull the other one off so you can see them side by side. You got the larger size and the smaller size. Um, the bigger one is obviously going to be the high pressure and the smaller one is the return. So I'm trying to track down a couple 90 degree fittings for that. And then I'm still probably gonna have to drill two new holes and then drop it a little bit, but kind of interesting those are the same size. Up on the front here, uh, the drive shaft, if you notice, it is a little bit too short. Now this here is called a double carbon style drive shaft. It's a high angle. So you see this a lot of times on vehicles uh, for the front drive shaft. I know the Ford Bronco. Uh, actually, now that I think about it, I think the Ford Broncos, because they had a really short wheelbase, I think they used a double carbon on the rear and then they used a more traditional one on the front. I think, I, I don't know. but. Uh, you've got a total of three uh, U-joints here, one, two, and then a third one down there. And then there's actually a third joint in there. It's a ball and socket joint. Ac actually, I think, I've, I think I've got one over here. Let me see. <laughs> uh, ball joint for inner CV. Let's see here. Yep, this is it. This is off of, uh, this is off of a Bronco that I put a six liter diesel in. So this one's used, but basically, there is uh, same thing same thing as the u-joints there's needle bearings all the way around there and then it's a little ball and socket that floats around and then there's a little bit of a lip on here so these actually have to be hammered out and then pressed back in and then on the drive shaft itself there's a little um, dealy bopper that sticks out that this ball actually slides into on that carbon joint and then there's a little seal that goes with it so they're a little bit of a pain to rebuild. Uh, this one, I'm not gonna have to rebuild because like I said, it's a little bit short. So I'm gonna have to take this to the drive shaft shop. Uh, they're gonna extend it two and a half inches. I've already done the measurements at full droop. So that'll, that'll give it enough room. If you see this is a slip shaft style, let me get the light on there. So it actually slides. It's just that I don't have quite enough room. And if you unscrew this right here, you'll see that these have shafts and then there's a, actually a little fitting right there so that you can keep the shaft all lubricated. So I'll get this over to Phoenix Rack and Axle. They'll make me a new one. And then when they make the new one, they'll do all new U-joints. All right, guys, I'm working on the exhaust system right now. And this is what I've come up with so far. It's a little bit hard to see from the top here, but you've got the header that runs down, runs across here in between the uh, oil pan and the transmission. And then it meets up to this Y right here, where I then have this nice little curve heading up to the uh, header on this side. Now this is, a little bit complicated. If you remember before, I purchased the header kit from DNA Motorsports. I really liked it. It's this nice stainless one here. The problem was 
the passenger side did not fit at all because it was designed for a modern style F350 that has a wider frame rails. And uh, I thought that that might be an issue, but usually what you could do is kind of massage it a little bit to kind of get it around either the, uh, like whatever's interfering, either the frame rail or if you have issues with the starter clearance. And then sometimes on the flange, you can just kind of cut it and then do like a kind of a triangle shape to it so that you can then bend the flange back in, re-weld it so you can change the angle. Unfortunately, it was interfering with too many places. So I had to get this aftermarket one. Now this one is designed for the old school 460s that have a different head. So one of the issues that we've got here, I don't know how well you can tell, but you'll be able to see a little bit better when I remove it, is that there's a tiny little air gap here because the port for the header is larger than the port that's in the head. Now the bolts all line up, but it's just a mismatch of the um, seal between the ports on the header and the ports on the head. So what I'm gonna have to do is pull this uh, header off on this side, and then I'm gonna have to use some filler material and weld in here, and then I'm gonna have to smooth it all out. But that's just kind of the nature on doing these custom builds. I'm pretty happy with it past right here. I really like how tight it turns in. I took all the measurements to make sure that the body is gonna clear this. And then I like how I was able to pull the exhaust as far away from the transmission as possible. I got it to this nice Y pipe and then I dropped it down. So I've got a perfect spot here to do the MagnaFlow muffler. And then from here, I'll do the exhaust out. So first things first, I've got to remove this exhaust because I do have it just tacked in right now and then I'll finish up welding it and then we'll be good to go. All right guys, I wanna show you these two headers here side by side. These are both the passenger side ones. The one on the bottom here, this is designed to mate up against the 1995 460. This one right here is designed to mate, I believe it's 87 and earlier, I'm not 100% sure. But if you see these little marks here, well, let me set this one down first. So you see these little marks at the top here? These were marks that I made on the head so that you could kind of see just this last little bit right here. This is where the exhaust gases would creep out around the head. It's going to be pretty straightforward. All I'm going to have to do is just fill this in with some weld and then I'm going to have to sand this back down nice and flush. So I'm going to do that on all four of these, get a nice clean line across here and then it should seal up against this gasket. This is how the gasket looks. So you can kind of see side by side right here missing that little area so just got to fill in just a little bit so I'll go ahead and fill that in and then I'll show you guys what it looks like all right guys I've got it all welded up on the top here you can see it's been sanded down to make it nice and smooth let me show you how the gasket now mates up with it Let's see here. so you see now the gasket's able to totally seal all the way around should be good to go so I'm gonna go get this installed and see uh, how it looks all right guys I went ahead and fitted this to the head and I did the same markings that you could see before just to show how much more the welds filled in so it should be good to go I don't know if I'm gonna paint this yet uh, sometimes what I'll do is I'll fire them up on the vehicles to get them nice and hot and then let them cool down before I paint them but that's usually because there's some type of a coating on this and this is just mild steel and it doesn't look like there's any coating I am gonna have to look into what this paint is going to do on the stainless headers because I've never actually painted stainless headers which is kind of a bummer I love the look of them I know that they do discolor obviously when they get hot but I don't want to have stainless on one side and then something that's painted on the other so I'll probably just have to paint this to match but once again I don't know if I'll heat it up and cool it down or not I hate doing that because then I have to uh, reuse the exhaust manifold gasket or get a new one but I don't know we'll cross that bridge when we get there that's a problem for future Austin all right, guys, it's time for the scariest part of any build. First start, it's always scary. Let me show you what I've done to prepare. All right, guys, first things first, I went through the Holly. This is the quick start manual for the sniper kit. I've uh, double checked the fuel system for any leaks. I've turned the key into the on position, which is just a switch right now, and that pressurizes the fuel line, so I made sure that that's working. I cycled it a few times. You can actually hear the air start to come out of the return line, and then when you do put the key in the on position, you get a little squirt of fuel, so I waited until I got the little squirt. Right now, I've got my mechanical oil pressure gauge hooked up to my oil line here, just to make sure that I can get a, an accurate reading. I've cranked it over. Uh, I did three cycles of five seconds just to make sure that my oil pressure is uh, pre, pre-loaded, I guess. So that's good to go. Uh, for, forgive me for this horrible wiring mess. I wanted to have everything just kind of set up as simply as possible so that I can make sure that this runs before I put the body on it. So 
Well, there's a little ghetto over here. Uh, like I said, I cranked it over and made sure everything's looking good on the belt side. The transmission line, I've got looped along with the power steering line. So basically we're bypassing those coolers. So I've double checked the entire fluid system, the uh, oil level's good, transmission level. Obviously I'm gonna have to put more in there. I've got seven quarts in it right now. It's a 15 quart system, but I have to wait for the torque converter to fill up. Oh, I guess that's it. This part's always scary though. Let me get the camera set up and then uh, we'll see what she can do. All right guys, ignition on. So it takes two and a half seconds for the Holly to turn on. And uh, in those two and a half seconds, your fuel pump is not primed and then it primes for five seconds. So they recommend not hopping in and then just quickly starting it like most people do on modern vehicles. They want you to get in there, turn it in the on position and wait. All right, so I heard a little bit of fuel squirt in there. Now's the time to crank over and let's see. getting any signal on my RPM. Everything else is working though. So I think that this is because I, I have this yellow wire not hooked up, which is gonna be the coil negative uh, for the HyperSpark. So let me hook that up and we'll try again. All right, the, um, what's it called here? The coil driver, ignition coil driver, has been bypassed and I've hooked up the yellow line which is the negative side of the coil for a traditional coil non-timing controlled setup. So let's see if it's happier with this. I'm not sure why they don't want you to have the timing control in the initial startup. If this doesn't work I'm going to end up clicking it back up. just showing stall so I'm still not getting an RPM signal something is hooked up incorrectly with the ignition I'm gonna hit the manual and see I may just hook it up to run on the hyper spark because they didn't give an adequate explanation for why you shouldn't start it with timing control all right I've got it set up to understand that the hyper spark is connected so let's see Alright guys, that's going to be it for this episode. The next one should be out in two weeks and it should be finishing up that interior. But this truck is coming along quite nice if I do say so myself. Now I want to share a little bit of good news. One of my subscribers, Aaron Cooley, was selected as a finalist for the Next American Innovator Challenge. And that is a custom motorcycle challenge put on by Paul Jr. And there's eight finalists left in the 125cc class and that's where he is because he took a KX125 dirt bike, flipped the frame upside down and turned it into a cool little chopper. So I'll put a link in the description so that you guys can actually vote for him, which would be very cool, and uh, check out the other finalists as well. And then I'll put in a link for his YouTube channel, which is Straight Line Cycles. Otherwise, uh, here's a fun little clip of my son finding another three-legged cricket. And I'll see you guys soon. Hey guys, my sister found a cricket with three legs. Two on that side and one on the other. Do you guys think this is cricky or three-legged cricket? Should we let him go outside? Yeah. It's able to jump like a grasshopper. It's able to jump like a grasshopper, guys. Oh, there he goes. Careful not to step on him. <laughs> See you later, Cricky. Thanks, Dad. Oh, man, this. Guys, this guy. Guys, this guy is not very good at jumping. This is much smaller than the last three-legged cricket. Who knew there were so many three-legged crickets?
Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.